professor of political science and public policy here at USC. Um, I study voting rights and race and ethnicity and campaigns and elections in the United States. I am currently the academic director of the USC Schwarzenegger Institute for State and Global Policy. Um, in this past year, we did a program um, administering grants to localities and former Voting Rights Act Section 5 states to open polling places, and I'm doing some research and writing about that experience now. Um, and now I'm going to pass it over to our colleague, Jody Armour. Thank you. I'm Jody Armour. I'm the Roy P. Crocker Professor of Law at the at Google School of Law. Um, I concentrate on the rule of law, race, legal decision making, um, and language as well. And I will um, now pass it back to um, pass it back to my colleagues. Um. Okay, so I'm going to kick off our conversation today with a question for you, Jody. Um, the United States Senate just this week passed a bill to make Juneteenth a federal holiday. So what do you think of the timing of this move? And what does it say about our country's reckoning with our long, long history of racial injustice? Yeah, it was unanimous at the Senate level, right? Unanimous uh, decision coming out of the Senate, the House also approved uh, the recognition of Juneteenth as a federal holiday, uh, not with unanimity, but with a you know, wide disparity. I think there were only 14 or so votes uh, against all the rest in favor of. And so you could spin this as a very kind of positive story, a feel good story, you know, the kind of story that a lot of people had, the kind of narrative that was being spun after uh, Obama got elected. Hey, we're post-racial. Now we're post-racial, officially 2008. You know, I think there may be uh, some people who say, well, we're recognizing Juneteenth now, so come on, that, th that should be uh, sufficient for us to, you know, kind of move on now. Let's, let, let's, let's just get along and, and move on. Um, when of course that is not at all what's going on. Uh, to the contrary, uh, this uh, holiday gives us an opportunity to connect the American Revolution in 1776, rather, to the second American Revolution, the one that we call the Civil War, the one that get, uh, Lincoln um, stood in Gettysburg and talked about when he said four score and seven years ago, our fathers founded a nation in liberty and equality, right? But, but that promise was flagrantly flouted for the next 80 years until we had a cataclysmic race war with 600,000 to 700,000 dead Americans, right? That, that Juneteenth is celebrating the promise of the first revolution being brought to a greater fruition in the second revolution, the civil war that said that at least black people are no longer chattel slaves. We may not be there yet, but at least we've gotten out of that yoke and officially extended to them a recognition as more than chattel slaves. So uh, at this moment of our racial reckoning, I think of the fact uh, just real quickly that, uh, you know, it, it's controversial whether you can teach this stuff in schools. You know, the number of legislatures around the country, 15 at last count, are stepping in and saying, um, saying America has racism at its foundation is forbidden. We don't want you saying that. And we don't want you saying things that are going to cast America in a negative light historically. So I don't know how in those jurisdictions they're going to explain to their high school, middle school, and grade school students when they ask them what Juneteenth is, how they're going to explain why we're, why we're celebrating Juneteenth without mentioning slavery. I'm not quite sure about that. But um, Annalisa, can you tell, what, what is your take on this? So you thought a lot about, a lot more about this you know, than I have for sure. And so I'd really be interested in your take on this moment of symbolism. You know, um, you, you know, some, many people are saying, oh, this is just hollow symbolism. I don't, I don't wanna hear anything about hollow symbolism. But that's not what they were saying when they were saying we wanna get those Confederate flags from flying over the state houses and we wanna get those Confederate monuments down. Then they were saying, yeah, we recognize that public symbolism is important. And right, it's something that we should take seriously. So what do you think? I'm interested in your insights at this moment. Right, um, so I think you I think you met Elena, but- um, I'm sorry, I, Elena. You, yes. No, it's fine, it's okay. Um, yeah, I think that 
one of the things that's really interesting about like this particular moment is that what we're having really is a conversation about what our values are as a nation and what are the types of things that we are going to hold dear to us and to memorialize and to symbolize right now, right? And so I think that in this converse, part of this conversation, it's very interesting, right? Because I think that since last summer, it doesn't really seem like anybody, as you said, is publicly disparaging Juneteenth. I, I don't think that there really has been anybody that is seriously saying, this is not something that we should uh, care about. This is not something that we should look at, right? This is not something that is important at all, right? Um, but I do think, right, that the question that you bring up of what is going to be taught in these particular jurisdictions, right, that are placing restrictions, right, that are continuing to place restrictions on full citizenship for Black people, for brown people, for poor people, right? What are the types of things that are going to be taught in those particular jurisdictions, right? One of the things that I think is particularly interesting about this issue of memorialization, when we look at in some of these jurisdictions, right, that are um, in the process, right, of, dis of further dismantling of like the last piece of the Voting Rights Act, right, that's still intact, they are now just destroying it, right? That a lot of these statues, right? That these Confederate statues that people are um, so upset, right? That people are tearing down, right? And with some of this conversation that they're having about, oh, like this is our history. This is the way that we memorialize things. This is what we stand for. So many of these were placed in public places from the 1920s to the 1940s, way after the Civil War as we were in a period of mass mobilization um, against lynching, against racial injustice, right? Right on the heels of, right on the cusp of the civil rights movement, right? These were, are not monuments really um, to Confederate history so much as they are monuments to white supremacy and to intimidation, right? And so I think that, um, you know, with this conversation around Juneteenth, some of the things that I've been really, really interested in is the symbolism, right? And is the memorialization and is this move to um, reframe what it is that's important to us as a country, right? And I think that some of this conversation about, oh, this is our history, right? Our values change as a nation. And I think that the conversations that we have and the holidays that we have should also change as well. Um, but with that said, I just, Christian, I want to ask you a question about, because, you know, we've been kind of dancing around this idea of what it is, right? We have, a, we had a, a unanimous Senate decision, right? Which is pretty interesting, um, right? But we're in the process of rolling back um, voting rights in so many jurisdictions. So can you speak a little bit about what it is that this really means and uh, some of like the struggle that really is happening behind the scenes for full democratic participation. Yeah, thanks. This is, I mean, this has been really interesting. Uh, I think, I mean, when I think about the move towards um, recognizing Juneteenth at the federal level that's happening right now, and yes, the, the unanimous consent agreement was reached last year, Senator Ron Johnson objected to that, and this year made a statement saying he did not choose to. Um, so the unanimity even came from, from those who in the past had, had not supported. Um, you know, I think that's interesting, and I think it's really a sign of, of things moving in a, in a good direction. Um, the fact that the Senate and the House are actually passing a uh, federal holiday. Um, if you look at the last 20 years of state legislatures, um, most have not had holidays for Juneteenth, but almost all have recognized Juneteenth, and it's all happened in the last the last several years. But at the same time, there's been substantive movement backwards in some directions, like in, like in voting rights. Um, so one thing I would keep an eye on is how even though like the historic recognition of Juneteenth is is so much better than the historic recognition of say the Robert E. Lee holiday, which in Arkansas was still part of 
of a, the MLK Day until a couple of years ago, for instance, right? That's that's an advance. That is that is progression in the country to be recognizing Juneteenth instead of the Robert E. Lee holiday. But it's very symbolic, right? And does it actually um, does it mean anything for voting rights? Does it mean anything for substantive policy reform? Um, I'm not sure. A lot of times, legislators can take symbolic positions that are popular on racial issues in order to actually avoid making substantive policy changes that maybe are a little more controversial, but important. And so I think, you know, we think about voting rights, Texas, um, where Juneteenth started, the state legislature has been trying to um, curb voting rights in pretty serious ways, right? Making it harder for localities to open drop boxes in Harris County, Texas, where Houston is located. Um, the, the, the proposed legislation, which was blocked in the, in the session recently, would make it a lot harder for that county to open um, polling places and drop boxes in communities of color. And that also happened in the 2020 election. Um, so I think that, and then this is happening in Georgia and proposed bills in North Carolina and other states um, as well. And then at the federal level, right, the Voting Rights Act uh, um, uh, extension of Section 5 is currently being proposed. And Joe Manchin has made some statements about supporting Section 5 coverage of the entire country as part of a compromise bill. Um, but I think that is perhaps more substantively important than the unanimous Juneteenth resolution, even though that's still important too. Um, and so, Jody, I was just curious what you thought about this, especially thinking about police reform and other policies and thinking about substantive movements where we have and have not seen changes um, going parallel to this move to celebrate Juneteenth. Yeah, it's an important issue that comes up again and again. How do you distinguish hollow symbolism, performative politics from real and lasting interventions that move the needle. And, um, you know, there are times when all you're getting is hollow symbolism. And I recognize the concern that many have about that. There was the embarrassment, for example, last year around this time when the George Floyd bill was introduced in DC and Congress people put kente cloth stoles on and, and knelt, you know, and there was a lot of dragging on Twitter and social media of that uh, kind of performative and embarrassingly hollow display. Um, and so I can understand why people pause and say that standing alone shouldn't be enough. But there are times when some, you know, struggles over symbols and their meanings are core parts of the political process. There, it's over symbols and their meanings that people unify and rally as collective actors a lot of times and push for real lasting political change. You don't get, you know, um, numbers without unity in a democracy are meaningless, right? You can have all the numbers in the world. You're not going to, you know, and, and power is wielded through numbers, but numbers without unity, without, uh, you know, collective action are meaningless, right? So how do you get people to unify, to rally together? It's often through symbolism, through, you know, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. You know, women unite, take back the night. You know, um, black is beautiful. You know, black lives matter. I mean, there's a lot of symbolism that's, that is very much core to political activism and political action. So I don't wanna draw this distinction necessarily between symbols and action. Sometimes symbolic work is a kind of important, you know, um, part of political action. Um, but, you know, it, it is, I, I hear you, we do have to be on guard against, you know, hollow symbolism robbing us of real change, which often happens too. We have to remain super vigilant about that. So there's no easy formula. We just have to stay vigilant and take it on, I think more of a case by case uh, basis. Elena, what do you think? You know, uh, I, I'm, I'm back to you because you're, for me, you know, I, I listen closely to um, what you're saying on this issue. So what do you think about uh, uh, what Christian and I are, 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 are coming down on in this? Right. I mean, I think that I would agree, you know, I think that I would agree with you that it's really important to make sure that this particular symbolic victory doesn't distract us from the larger work that we need to do in terms of racial 
injustice in this country, right? And I think that going back to what we were saying before, that this might be a strategy that some more conservative politicians are using, right? Voting unanimously to make this a holiday. Because what does, because yes, memorialization is incredibly important and symbolism is incredibly important. But by just saying, okay, we're gonna make this a holiday, and then not doing anything else, right? We leave intact the structures that contribute to racial injustice and racial inequality in this country, right? Making Juneteenth a federal holiday is not going to change the fact that Black Americans disproportionately died from COVID. It's not going to change the fact, right, that when our students come into our classrooms, they don't see people that look like me, right? That look like you, Jody, right? Like, so, I mean, it doesn't change the fact that, right? Like that so many of my students are like, we never, we didn't know that a professor could be like young and black and female, right? Like it doesn't change those things, right? So I think that um, it's so, uh, it's such a danger, right? Um, and we need to keep our eyes open at all times. That being said, you know, I want to talk about also historically the fact that symbols, particularly symbols that um, people have rallied around particular symbols that this that these have driven unity and driven social movements, right? And that in particular, right, in my research, when I look at how um, I look at not only, for instance, how Islam, how people converted to Islam as a as a way to push forward um, social justice and equality, but how non-Muslims actually used Islam right as a symbol of justice, right? Like how they looked towards that. And so I think that symbolism can be super, super powerful, Jody, as you were saying. And so I don't want to knock that at all. I think that it has historical precedent, but I also think, you know, that, um, we're at a moment where we have the ability to keep our eye on the prize and to make real change. And we need to keep our foot on the gas, not take it off, right? And be distracted by anything that might, um, you know, get in the way. I think that this is one small victory on the road to what we need to be many, many, many victories. Um, but uh, so, I just want, I want to um, turn the conversation to, I, I think that we, did we lose Chris? I think that we might've lost Christian um, for well, a moment. We're waiting but... for him to come back, um, Elena. Let me, uh, let me uh, go with you on, on your point that I like a lot, uh, your points that I like a lot, um, that we don't, you know, lose track of substantive change by getting too much caught up in hollow symbolism. I think Juneteenth may be more than hollow symbolism. It all depends on what we do with it, of course, right? But I think it may be helpful, at least in this regard. When you get 100%, when you get rather, not 100%, when you get unanimity with some extensions from the senators on the recognition of Juneteenth as an official national federal public holiday, Collective symbolism, public symbolism is hard at work now at, at that point, right? How do those same senators go back to their jurisdictions and support bills, like I said before, that say, we don't want to talk about slavery? Mm -hmm. Are you, be careful if you talk about, be careful if you talk about systemic racism. Be careful if you say anything about racism being at the foundation of America. Well, look, Juneteenth is about racism being at the foundation of America. It's in the Constitution, right? It can't, doesn't get no more foundational than that, mm -hmm. folks. Right? So at least it creates that kind of glaring cognitive dissonance, doesn't it? At least it presents that, that, the possibility for that. But I don't know, what, what, what is your sense, Christian? Yeah, I actually, I mean, I think that the 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 memorialization of it at the federal level is pretty big. And I do think that, you know, the idea that the Senate is unanimous with this and the so many House members, especially given their varying views substantively is pretty is pretty surprising in, uh, in some ways. And so I think that's that's something um, that's really contrary to everything else that's going on, right? With the 
ba attempted bans at critical race theory, trying to, to dictate what can be taught in public schools. Um, I mean, some of that I think is actually just kind of ridiculous because it's how can you dictate what like the teaching of theory that's almost hard to do without if you're teaching <laughs> like you're going to be discussing thing uh, theory. Um, but um, I, I find it it's a little bit of cognitive dissonance, right, that it's this this um, I, I know earlier I said that there's, you know, this is a fairly symbolic um, move and isn't that substantive, but it does sort of contrast with a lot of other symbolic moves to to ban things to ban teaching of slavery in schools to ban teaching of critical race theory i think that's um, um i mean in some ways it's just the way the united states is right like the the u.s is not going forward or backward we often are going forward and backward at the same time right in different directions and so i think this this squares with that um, what about you elena um yeah, I'm really interested, actually, to, to think about actually what you just said, Christian, which goes into this, uh, this question about theory. I think that somebody from the audience had a question about kind of the backlash to critical race theory and the question about, but the question about would we even be talking about Juneteenth without critical race theory, right? Like, what is the relationship of theory to action and social change, right? For me, I think that this is, I think that the backlash to critical race theory goes to the root of so much of what we've been talking about, right? That ultimately it requires acceptance that this country was founded on racist, basically racist principles, right? That it is that at the core that there are structures which support the subjugation of certain people um and that if we continue that that white supremacy wins essentially right and so i think that this is very difficult for people to accept because it requires for those who are in power to give up some of that power and i think that they are extremely resistant to it I also think that there are people who look like people who are in power who have been made to believe that if they just put their nose to the grindstone and keep on working and, um, you know, uh, emulate these people that they too can be in power one day, right? And we know that that isn't true, right? People tend to stay in their same social classes right, they, a lot of people don't even leave, right, the places that they were, that they were born, right, um, so I think that, um, I think that critical race theory upends so much about the American narrative of progress, right, personal progress, and the American dream, um, and I think that that's part of the backlash to it. Would we even be talking about Juneteenth without it, I don't know. I, you know, I'm not a theory head. I'm a, histo I'm a historian, so I'm not a theory head, right? We, like as historians, we, for me, good theory comes from practice, right? Like it comes from like the realities that are in front of you. So theory for me organizes the thoughts that you have about facts, right? About what you see in the world. And so I think that we would be talking about it in a sense. I think that critical race theory gives us a framework in order to articulate exactly what um, the benefits and the problems are. Um, what can I ask, um, Christian, what do, what do you kind of, uh, or you know what, since Christian, since you kicked it to me, Jody, what do you think about that? Yeah, um, I think that you know, as someone who's been writing critical race theory for about 25 years, and I'm getting ready to teach it at a public university in Florida where they've outlawed critical race theory. So I guess my students are going to have to wrap my books in cheesecloth and smuggle them into the classroom while we traffic in transgressive utterances such as systemic racism and unconscious bias and white supremacy. Um, but I, I don't see critical race theory as having given rise to Juneteenth because uh, a lot of the people even who support Juneteenth are critical of critical race theory. 
<laughs> right? Uh, what, what Juneteenth is a, re, re, uh, a product of, what we're celebrating now, is what it is a product of, is that generational upheaval we saw on these streets last year this time. That's six weeks in a row out here in LA, day in and day out, right? The, the, that reverberated you know, at the ballot boxes with bringing in George Gascon and ousting Jackie Lacey and bringing in Measure J, which is a defund the police measure by a different name, 10% of the county's unrestricted funds up to, um, are you still there? Yeah, up to, uh, you know, the county unrestricted budget up to $10 billion a year. So that's up to a billion dollars a year to non-incarceration alternatives. Um, uh, that, those kinds of, you know, jaw dropping changes came from the activism, the grassroots activism in the street over the summer. And we're seeing it with Larry Krasner, you know, being beaten down his primary challenger as a progressive prosecutor in Philadelphia, even though people were saying, oh, spikes in crime mean people are going to blame progressive prosecutors. This movement has legs. And this and Juneteenth is a yet another expression of the legs that this and this this move this movement that we've uh, been, all been a witness to uh, that has been had black women at its vanguard because that's what Black Lives Matter is really driven by. It's a leader full movement, not a leaderless movement. But those, among those leaders in Black Lives Matter, the, the you know the ones I see doing the work and and the and representing you know, um, unrelentingly are, are black women and, and, um, and LGBTQ folk, um, right? So uh, that, that, that I, I think, when I think about this, the, this um, Juneteenth moment that we're in right now, I think about the, the I, I think about the victories and triumphs that can come from grassroots organizing and political activism. That, you know, that's kind of what comes to me, but you know, I'm, I, you, I'm, you, you study political animals day in and day out, Christian. So what do you think about, you know, the, the, the political part of, you know, of, of thinking about how we got to this moment where we have so many Congress folk who otherwise are not supportive of critical race theory, but they are supportive of Juneteenth. Yeah, I mean, I think I think on the critical race theory, I think it's just taken it did it, it, to elected official that doesn't actually mean what we think of the term in academia. It's just a catch all for sort of this is something that I want to ban. Right. And a lot of legislators are doing that. And it just to me, it just doesn't make any sense. Like it's like like it's it's like banning discussion in a classroom on anything. Right. I mean, like, how can you ban discussing theory how can you ban discussing race when you're discussing the united states it doesn't make any sense um and if that's if that actually happens it's a real problem for students right of america um and one of the things i think like if we thinking about what we do at usc and what we do as academics is we think and theorize and talk about uncomfortable things we talk about we talk about race how could you study the united states without without engaging critical race theory it doesn't make any sense um so i don't know that's my that's my like less nuanced take on the the bills um but i do think why are they doing it i mean i think they're doing it because it's a you know it's a way to basically sort of create a a, a sort of a catch-all phrase that doesn't really um that's it, not really what critical race theory is. It's not really what we're doing in the classroom and what people are teaching. And it's it's and in some ways it's kind of scary because it does harken back to the attempts to you know to ban to ban speech, to ban thought, to the way we think about things. And you know what we do at a university, what we do at USC is talk about ideas and talk about them freely. And the idea of not discussing certain topics is is pretty bad. Um, and so that that's my I don't know that's my thought on it, but not as nuanced on why are they doing it. But Christian and Elena, what, what do you think about this push? Let me push back a little bit. Let me let me channel some of my um, let me channel some of my Fox News uh, for a moment and ask you this. Uh, although you know um, I'm not I'm not you know tarring with the same brush everyone over at Fox. They have some very good reporters actually. But you know there's a perspective that they've taken a stance politically for some time. And one of those is that critical race theory, at least the national at uh, the national level, you hear them saying critical race theory, not only is about racism being foundational to America, they have a problem with that too, but okay, it's also teaching white people and white children that whites are villains. It's villainizing white people. 
right? And, and nobody should be villainized because of their race, right? This is what I hear again and again. You know, I try to kind of dial into where they're coming from because sometimes I think it's hard for us to understand if we're in our own kind of more progressive, inclusive, you know, um, spaces where other people, what they might even be thinking. So I try to understand, I try to tell my students, if you're taking on a case, you need to write a brief for the other side that's more eloquent than they can write and then take on, take out that brief, right? So from their perspective, that's where they seem to be coming from. You're villainizing white people, you're villainizing, you're teaching white children to think of themselves as villains. How do you respond to that? Yeah, I, I don't think that, so I think that what's being villainized, right, is white supremacy, not whiteness, right? But I also think that we have to understand, right, that all of these things are constructions, right? Like whiteness is a construction. Um, and it, it is uh, a way to frame how right, power right over particular particular people. Um, I think that nobody wants to villainize white children, right? Like nobody is, in I mean, I think that this is valid, valid, right? Like nobody is inherently bad, right? Nobody is inherently evil because of their skin color or their race. We certainly don't want to flip the script and now make just another uh, racial group, right, villainized. But that does not take away the history and the reality of what white people and white supremacy has done in order to subjugate black people, right? And everybody needs to reckon with that history. And I think that we have, right, as we wrap up here, we have a question from the audience about what's the metric, right, of measurement for the end game, right? And for me, the measurement of, of uh, the metric of measurement for the end game is if we get to a place where everybody is working to transform this country in a way that makes it more equitable, um, that to me is the end game, right? Like, and we can only kind of get to, Right, I can only get to a place like where I'm educating people about the history of racism um, and race in this country and hoping that they take that with them into their their careers and their lives, right? And that they use that to make transformational change. Um, Christian, what do you what do you think as we as we wrap up here? Yeah, I mean, just think of like what is the end game? Like what is the you know, the, I think something bring it back to Juneteenth would be to think think about not just Juneteenth as a celebration and the history that's well super important to also think about what what goes ha what goes forward in the future right and so I think you know the idea I mean for me the idea coming back to this critical race theory discussion and just the idea of banning what's discussed in classrooms I think that's uh the kind of thing that we need to remember we need to we need to make sure we have free and open discussion about all scholarly and academic topics and the idea of of um of like bans on critical race theory is, is troubling and so i don't know that's not much of an end what is the end game but I mean, one end game would be to not to if have more symbolic measures like juneteenth holidays and less banning of critical race theory is a very small end game but that would be something and then just think about substantive change like what substantive change i i echo what you were saying elena what could be done um, in the future about voting rights, police reform, um, actual equitable outcomes um, in policy, and not uh, not only important um, symbolic measures like Juneteenth. What about right. you, Jenny? Well, yeah. The, for me, the end game is fairly straightforward and simple. You know, I need to be able to walk down. Skid Row here in LA, the fiercest expression of structural violence in America, the highest concentration of houseless folk in America. I need to be able to walk down those streets and not turn to the left and right and see 75% of those faces black. I need to go and be able to go into San Quentin, take my students into San Quentin and not see racial dem demographics that are similar to Skid Row. I need to go into some of these hospitals and not see COVID raging through black bodies disproportionately. 
right? I need to look at a lot of very simple, straightforward, concrete stuff and say, when I stop seeing black faces grossly disproportionately in the bowels of this nation's misery, you know, the misery index for black folks has gotten better for some like me, pe people living in View Park, you know, pe people who are the black bourgeoisie, the black middle class, life is better than ever for us. But like I just told you, go, go walk through Skid Row and you see for many of our brothers and sisters, things have never been worse. And, uh, and figuring out how to solve that and recognizing that the solution to that is going to take a radical overhaul, a revolution in consciousness, the way we're seeing it happen in, in criminal justice system, for example, where we've moved away from retribution, retaliation, and revenge as our moral framework and moral compass when it comes to criminal matters toward restoration, reconciliation, restoration rather, rehabilitation, and redemption. Right? That, that's what Gaston came in on, Jackie Lacey accused to the old law and order, tough on crime. The voters said no, Proposition 47, no, Chase Boudin, you know, Larry Krasner, they, they, we fundamentally shifted our moral framework when it comes to blame and punishment because that's the only way we're going to do anything about racialized mass incarceration or the new Jim Crow. So those kind of revolutions in consciousness are what I wanna, I'm, I'm gonna have to see for us to change, turn things around for places like Skid Row and San Quentin. Yeah, Jody, I think that that's um, a beautiful place to to stop. Um, and uh, so I I loved having a conversation with you guys. I hope that we can continue to have um, more conversations in person again now that COVID is ebbing. And um, so we are out of time, everybody. Thank you so much to my co-hosts and thank you to our audience for joining us here on USC Facebook Live. See you guys all soon. Thank you, Elaine.